This is our second lecture on the Vietnam War. We're still technically in chapter 25. A lot of this information will come from 25, but some of it won't. But what I want to do in this lecture is to finish um, talking about the war. Uh, we're not actually going to end the war yet. We'll do that next week. But uh, I want to finish talking about the war. We'll also say a few things about the countercultural movement that's going on at the same time. Meanwhile, we've got a feminist revolution which, which is going on. We'll say some things about that, and we'll end up talking about the sexual revolution. Lots of stuff going on in the 1960s. So uh, opposition to the war came when the public finally realized that this war just could not be won. And so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about why the U.S. lost the Vietnam War. You can see up in the left-hand corner of this slide the word progress. So I'm going to explain why the U.S. lost, and I'm going to do it with a slide. And uh, I've got a lot of, of, of text on this slide, so just to make it a little bit easier to follow. So why did the U.S. lose the Vietnam War? It kind of begins... Our, this explanation begins with trying to figure out how the war progress, how, how the, how, what kind of progress, uh, how, how progress could be measured. Let's put it like that. Uh, often wars are easily measured. At least the progress is easily measured by things like the acquisition of territory, but that wasn't the case in the Vietnam War because the U.S. wasn't out, was not out to get territory. We weren't invading the North, communist North. We were simply trying to keep the South from falling to the North, the North communi uh, communist, and also to Southern communists. There are communists in South Vietnam, and these communists were known as the Viet Cong, V-I-E-T, and then C-O-N-G, the Viet Cong. So these are people who live in the Vietnamese, who live in the southern uh, part of Vietnam, but they are fighting as communists. They want the South to fall and be a part uh, of a whole unified communist Vietnam. So how do you measure this kind of progress? Well, one way to measure it is to count body counts. And this is really the way the, the military for much of the Vietnam War measured progress. The Vietnamese body counts were just incredible on scale. Throughout the war, over 500,000 civilians from both the North and the South died. As far as combatants from the North, Northern Communist, and from the South, uh, Southern Communist. These are, again, both enemies to the United States and to the government in South Vietnam. Um, Northern Communists and Viet Cong are enemies to the Americans. 800,000 Northern Vietnamese uh, and Viet Cong died in this war. On the American side, there was a growing casualty list. By the time the war was over, 58,000 Americans had died. And so body counts was one way for the U.S. to try to measure progress. There was also a growing financial call. So the U.S. Uh, 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 killing lots of the enemy, again, 800,000 uh, of the enemy dead throughout the war, but also a growing list of American casualties. But not only that, there's a growing financial cost to this war. By 1968, the U.S. was spending roughly about $2 billion every month. For every Viet Cong killed, it was costing the American taxpayer $322,000. So were we winning? Uh, yeah, we're, we're running up casualties on the other side, but they're very expensive and Americans were dying in the process. So, so were we winning? What did it mean to actually win this war? A win for the U.S. simply meant that the U.S. prevented the Communist North and the Viet Cong in the South from controlling the South. So that's what a, a win looked like. 
So in order to do this, the U.S. had to maintain a presence in Vietnam. We didn't maintain a presence in the North. We were never in the North. We didn't invade the North. We did, however, bomb the North. That's where the communist, uh, communists were. But we just simply held on to the South, and that's what a win looked like, uh, would look like. We had to keep the Northern communists and the Viet Cong out of the South, or, or at least keep them from winning the South, and just stay there until they finally decided to stop. There are two problems with this. One is that the communist North was determined to win. Ho Chi Minh and his, his Northern communist were determined not to lose this war. He said once that uh, uh, the American, to the Americans, he said, you can kill 10 of our men for every one of yours that we kill. But even at those odds, you will lose and we will win. So 10, 10 Northern Vietnamese could die for every one American, but even with those odds, Ho Chi Minh said, the North would still prevail in this war. Also, another problem with this winning strategy was that the U.S. was fighting a limited war. And the U.S. was doing that because President Johnson believe that if the U.S. escalation reached certain levels, remember the last time we saw those numbers, I believe 19, the numbers in 1968 were around 540,000 American troops in South Vietnam. But Johnson was afraid if the U.S. escalated much more than that, then the Chinese communist and or the Soviets would intervene by helping the North. Um, both sides, both the Chinese and the Soviets, helped to some degree uh, the Northern Communists, but Johnson feared that they would get involved even more if the U.S. overwhelmed Vietnam with American troops. So we're fighting a limited war. The North was determined to win. Progress was hard and really impossible to measure. And there was just simply no way of winning this war. There was no way the U.S. would outlast the communist Vietnamese by holding on to the South. So this is why the U.S. was doomed to lose this war. Now, as the war continued, opposition began to grow in the United States, particularly by 1967, when much of the public realized that this war could not be won. The American public uh, showed their opposition in a lot of different ways. Anti-war demonstrations, such as in this picture, where uh, we've got some uh, anti-war demonstrators at the Pentagon. Also, for example, men burned their draft, tick, uh, draft cards and refused to show up for the draft. And Americans were really just divided, beginning in 1967, between those who backed the war, called hawks, and those who opposed the war called doves. So America had pretty much divided by 1967 and certainly by 1968. 1968 was an important year because just like we do every four years, we elect a new president. President Johnson knew that the war was not popular, and as a result, he knew that he was not popular. And so he made his decision to not run for reelection and he made that when he he made that announcement it was big news uh america was surprised but this meant that we needed a couple of new candidates and so the democratic party um fielded johnson's vice president hubert humphrey who was a democrat also of course and humphrey was running on a platform of staying with president johnson's um, approach to the war in Vietnam. His opponent was Richard Nixon from California, who was a Republican. And so these are the two men who ran for the presidency in 1968. Of course, Richard Nixon won. And um, the, the U.S., after he was elected and sworn in in 1969, the U.S. remained in Vietnam for four more years. So I don't want to talk about the end of the war just yet. We'll talk about the end and uh, Richard Nixon uh, a little bit later in another lecture. So I want to move to the countercultural movement right now. So let's leave the Vietnam War aside. It's going on in the background. 
and Americans are opposed to it, particularly young Americans. And this created a crisis of authority in the U.S. Our government is backing the war. Our government is fighting the war. And yet some Americans are questioning this war and they're questioning those of us who are leading uh, th those uh, who are leading us into that war, particularly the president, our main authority figure. He's being questioned. So uh, young Americans were questioning traditional notions of authority like the government. And uh, they, there's a, they, they soon started questioning really everything, not just the president, not just our government, but really everything. They started questioning religion, talking about younger Americans here, those in their 20s and, and below. They started questioning religion. They started questioning the middle class work ethic. They started questioning education in general. They started questioning marriage, all those traditional things. Um, we're not interested in that map right now. The movie to watch here is The Graduate. It's a movie that came out in 1967. This is the movie where Dustin Hoffman got his big start. Dustin Hoffman is a young guy who's in college or he's college age, and he's just uh, uh, questioning uh, the the reason why he needs an education, the reason why he needs any kind of work ethic. He's questioning marriage and uh, religion and all kinds of things. So if you want to kind of see a movie that's mirroring the culture in 1967, this is the one to watch. But this questioning of authority, this crisis of authority, created a spirit of rebelliousness. So young Americans were rebelling as they're questioning authority. They're rebelling against things that were uh, traditionally expected of them. And this became a cultural movement, and this is the counter-cultural movement. Young people began dressing differently. Young men grew their hair long. They had not traditionally done this. They wore bright colors, bell bottoms, beads, sandals. Women went without, young women went without makeup. And all of this is showing defiance. Uh, this is a way that these young people are showing defiance. And many of Americans' youth uh, embrace this, these countercultural ways of doing things. And many of them uh, who uh, um, embrace this uh, carried this further than others because they also embraced mind-altering drugs like marijuana, which had been used for several decades in the United States. But other newer drugs like LSD and heroin also became common. All right, those who embraced this countercultural movement were called hippies, and they had slogans, slogans that you've probably heard before, like do your own thing, make love, not war, tune in, turn on, drop out, and my favorite, don't trust anyone over 30. These sound kind of quaint to us today. They've been parried so much that they've really lost their meaning, but in the late 1960s, these were defiant and these were rebellious, and they really meant something. And these kinds of uh, slogans scared the older people. All right, while the countercultural movement is going on, uh, this rebelliousness in the 60s, and also keep in mind the civil rights movement is going on as well. So you put those things together, and we've got um, the makings of a feminist movement. So women were empowered by the rebelliousness, the questioning of authority. They were empowered by the civil rights movement, and they began to demand equal opportunities and rights. Now, they'd already gotten equal political, uh, they'd already gotten political equality with that 19th Amendment back in 1920. And remember those flappers in the 1920s? They had helped gain personal freedom for women. But now in the 1960s, Women wanted equality in the workplace. They wanted equality in the workplace. And the woman who best explained this was a woman named Betty Friedan, or, or sorry, Betty Friedan, um, who wrote The Feminine Mystique, published in 1963. It was a bestseller. And in this book, Friedan said that women did not want to be housewives. They did not want to be mothers only. They wanted more fulfilling lives. Now, what she's rebelling against really is the culture of the 1950s. We haven't talked about this, but 
women in the 1950s were pushed toward motherhood and they were pushed to become homemakers. The media pushed them to do this, advertised them, uh, advertisements pushed them to do this. So Friedan is rebelling against that. And she said it's degrading to make women become, or to, to in a sense, force them or push them to become housewives and mothers only. She said that they wanted more opportunities for careers. Now, what Friedan is helping to start here is known as the second wave of feminism, the second wave of feminism. The first wave, by the way, was way back in the 1840s, long before um, our, our scope here. But this is the second wave. And so feminists were challenging the status quo just as the, ca the countercultural movement was. They wanted to be treated equally in the, in the workplace once they got there. It's important to note that the reason they want this, of course, is because they had been discriminated against. And it had been legal to discriminate against them. And that meant that it had been legal to pay women less than what men were paid. In 1963, there was a big win for this feminist movement known as the Equal Pay Act. And what this did was it attempted to abolish the wage disparity based on sex between men and women, making it illegal to pay women less than men for doing the same job. The problem with this Equal Pay Act is that it was not fully enforced. Here are some figures to show that. Just two years later, in 1965, women who comprised 51% of the nation's population and held 37% of the jobs were only paid 42% or were paid 42% less of what men were paid. In other words, they were paid 58% of what men were paid. And so women um, didn't think this was right. And they thought that because of the Equal Pay Act, this should not certainly not be the case. The problem was enforcement here. But even though enforcement was lacking, society was still changing and the attitudes toward women were changing. And this is easy to see in popular culture, particularly in television. And more particularly, more specific, with a particular television show, The Mary Tyler Moore Show, which aired from 1970 to 1977. The reason, and, and this was one of the more popular shows of those seven years in the early 70s. The reason this show is so significant is because the main character, Mary Tyler Moore, was unmarried. She was an independent career woman, and she had no kids. This was rare in the 1970s. And it was rare to put that kind of woman at the center of a television show. The show also, by the way, dealt with issues such as equal pay for women and premarital sex. So this was a, a significant show to help get uh, this feminine movement kind of front and center in popular culture. And so society was talking a lot about sex. They, they talked about sex on this show. And this brings us to the sexual revolution. A lot of stuff going on in the 1960s. And so this, femi this feminist movement coincides with the so-called sexual revolution of the 1960s. This is a, um, really the, the core of this movement is, the, uh, is that Americans were becoming more tolerant of premarital sex. Now, why are they becoming more tolerant in the 1960s? Well, mainly because women were becoming more sexually active outside of, mar of marriage. Now, statistics about uh, sex are very troublesome because the question about reliability always pops up. But here's an interesting statistic. Between the years 1960 and 1975, that's a 15 year scope there, 1960 and 1975, the number of college women engaging in sexual intercourse doubled from 25% of all college age women engaging in sexual intercourse to 50%. In other words, half of all American college age women were engaging in sexual intercourse. Again, that's a, that number had doubled, uh, by 1975 from 1960 
figures. And the reason this is happening, one of the main reasons this was happening is the birth control pill, which was introduced to the American public in 1960. This was a scientific breakthrough approved by the FDA in 1960, which is why it was introduced then. Now, what's so important about the birth control pill? I'll give you a few things. It allowed sex to be reliably separated from procreation. This changed society in a lot of ways. One way is that it gave women more control over their bodies. It gave women more control over their futures. In other words, it gave women a lot more freedom because they had a lot more choices now. They could choose whether or not they wanted to get pregnant. And then finally, the birth control pill helped to bring sex into the open. It became a topic of discussion in public forums, on TV. And what's interesting about this is back in the 1950s, one of the, the most popular shows was I Love Lucy. And even though in one season Lucy was pregnant, the show would not talk about pregnancy. It wouldn't even say the word pregnancy. And that was in the 1950s, so that by the early 1970s, Mary Tyler Moore is openly talking about sex. So something happened in the 1960s, and that something was the sexual revolution. There's a group of people who didn't like this change. They didn't like the sexual revolution. They didn't like the feminist movement. They didn't like the countercultural movement. They didn't so much like the civil rights movement. They didn't like the anti-war movement of the Vietnam. And these are social conservatives. And this is the group that we'll talk about next.